Hi, I'm Malika Bilal in for Femi OK, and you're in the stream. Today, deconstructing New Orleans reconstruction, 10 years after Hurricane Katrina. Our digital producer and my co-host, Omar Wadar, is looking out for your live feedback, and they're already sending it. A lot of it actually is coming in, and one of the hashtags that a lot of people are talking about is 10 years, 10 words. That's people who are looking back at the city 10 years after the disaster and describing how they feel about it in 10 words. So we have Brian here who says, can't believe parts of my city are still messed up. You have Leslie who says, before it was a hashtag, it was my worst nightmare. And then we have Mike over here who says, Katrina brought me, met wife, house, babies, never leaving home. Now, even though that's a really moving sentiment, it's also a more controversial one because there are some people who are seeing this influx of new people changing the character of the city. This is going to be one of the things that we're going to be discussing today. But in the meantime, for those at home, use the hashtag AJStream, and we'll try to get your input during the show. I'm looking Malik. forward to it. Now, joining our online community via Skype, Erica McConduit Diggs is the president and CEO of the Urban League of Greater New Orleans. Also in New Orleans, Renard Sanders is an education consultant former school principal and host of the radio show, The New Orleans Imperative. Terry Coleman, a New Orleans native, is a black academic, a parent and an instructor at Dillard University. And journalist Anthony Lowenstein is the author of the forthcoming book, Disaster Capitalism, Making a Killing Out of Catastrophe. He's joining us from Juba, South Sudan. Welcome everyone to the stream. Now before we get rolling, let me fill in our community about the city our guests call home. New Orleans is a rich mix of cultures, and until Hurricane Katrina, the port city was probably best known for its jazz. But that changed on August 29, 2005, with one of the deadliest storms in U.S. history. Uh, they are expecting some, some severe damage. Five or six hours now of heavy rain to go along with that. The Salvation Army plans to serve where there are sewage Hurricane Katrina killed about 1,800 people across the Gulf Coast region. It displaced more than 1 million people. Entire families fled the state as floodwaters washed away their neighborhoods. Many have not returned. Since the storm, New Orleans turned into an experiment in so-called disaster capitalism. New education, housing, and labor policies are in play, but critics say they're hurting the longtime residents who most need help. I want you to take a look at this video from Burnell Colton, who set up the first post-Katrina grocery store in one of the city's hardest hit neighborhoods. That's the Lower Ninth Ward. Have a listen. The biggest misconception is that the New Orleans is, is completely recovered. And it's not the Lower Ninth Ward, no, it's nowhere near. We still have such a long, long way to go. It's the media stopped taking um, pictures of the Lower Ninth Ward. When, when you, if you live in Utah, California, New York, and you turn on the television, you're going to see Bourbon Street. You're going to see the French Quarter. You'll see the Superdome. But you won't see the Lower Ninth Ward. Well, Terry, he says you won't see the Nor Lower Ninth Ward. So when you listen to that testimony, really, does that resonate with you? What's, what's changed in your own neighborhood? Um, I think for me that resonates a lot. I'm from Gentilly, which was really, really devastated. The London Avenue Canal, depending on where you put the markers on Gentilly, is like at the edge of Gentilly. Um, but Gentilly wasn't a place that you could see in national media coverage because it's not a place that's dramatic or exotic. Like it doesn't have shotgun houses and those like authentic, exotic New Orleans architecture. Instead, it's a bunch of bungalows and middle class people. And we didn't appear in national coverage, so we were kind of erased. And that is really difficult because national coverage re and international coverage really shaped, it really shaped where resources went directly after the storm. Like if you were on the radar of outsiders, you didn't matter enough to justify having resources used on you. So it was dangerous for us to be erased and it hurt. Gosh, you're just hearing you say that really gives me pause being erased and it takes me to a picture that you sent the stream and this is rewinding 10 years this is a picture of you when you were leaving the city or preparing to leave the city you can take a look at my laptop here uh, and I believe this is your nephew here right and this is you in the corner yeah. reading a book and you then you can just see all this debris tell us about this time what was happening here um, so that picture was taken about 
maybe like 10 days after the storm, I'm not completely sure, we got airlifted from our house in Gentilly, and the, um, I found out much later that there was, the way disaster preparedness worked, there was this idea that there would be these lily pads of resources, so they would take people who from the most devastated areas inside the city and then airlift them to these areas directly outside the city where then they could have transportation or deal with supplies or whatever. So I got, my family got airlifted first to the lakefront airport and then to one of these lily pads, which was on the um, I-10, 610 interstate. And, but the, so the plan was, you know, you move the people there and then, then you help them, then you move them where they need to go or something. But then second half of the plan never happened. So instead they just dropped us off on the interstate with thousands of people and so much trash and like 10 porta potties and no food and no water and basic, and there was media coverage of us. So there were like, there were um, media people on the overpass above us, like literally looking down, watching us kind of perform like desperation and pain. And it was just like the surreal, horrible, horrible feeling. And we're actually, we're, we're sorry to have to take you back there, but we are um, thankful that you're sharing that time of your life with us. Erica, I could see you nodding a bit when Terry was telling that story. And I know your own story of evacuation was pretty incredible. You were pregnant at the time? I was nine months pregnant when Katrina hit. Yes, <laughs> nine months pregnant. And um, I didn't want to evacuate. I mean, the reality is, is that if you are native New Orleanian, you stay. And so I, you know, it's, it's still very offensive when people say, well, why didn't people just leave? Well, you don't just leave. You know, when you live in this area of the world, you know what it what to expect. <laughs> and so you ride it out. And so, but my mom was very insistent. She said, you're pregnant, I have the grandkids, we have to leave. Um, and so we were stuck in traffic driving to Houston, which is normally like a five and a half hour trip. It took us over 16 hours. All of us crowded up into a hotel room. Clearly, we, when we saw what happened, Honestly, I could not come back with a newborn baby to a hotel room with dogs and a whole bunch of people. Um, and so I drove from Houston, Texas to New York, um, which is a, a, a place I had lived before and I had my first child, but I felt like at least there I had a hospital, I had doctors, I could, you know, maybe fend for myself a little bit better than a city I didn't know. Um, and so I made the cross country journey over two and a half days because I was too far along to fly. Um, so we had to drive all the way to New York. It was just, honestly, when I heard the, the prior story and I even think back to mine and I see these videos, it just gives me the chills because it is still so real. It is still so real. So uh, Malika, we put out a question to our community about what misconceptions there are about the city right now. And it's funny, we got some stuff that is talking about the negative uh, perceptions uh, that are there about the city. So you have John here who tweeted in saying, honestly, people think this is just a party city filled with crime that is still trying to recover from a storm 10 years ago. Goes on to say, we are a city filled with unique cultures. There is something about the city that just makes you feel at home, even if you weren't born here. And uh, Renard, right on that point, um, given the fact that there are a lot of people who have basically do feel like this city has become home after the storm. Can you talk about just how the influx of new people has changed the character of the city? Well, um, I think that um, probably more negatively than anything else, what people are frustrated about is that there has been an initiative uh, locally by policymakers to uh, more or less promote bringing in other people to become the leaders and to basically help us with our problems and those kinds of things, and have turned it back on the local community. So in our school district, um, we have um, a decrease in the number of African-American teachers and an increase in the number of white teachers, mostly who are from Teach for America. We had 7,500 uh, school employees that were fired. Um, very questionable and illegally, in my opinion. And now we have a school district that is totally different, and they have been replaced with these uh, people who are from the outside, Teach for America, maybe well-intended, but certainly not trained to teach. And the local community feels left out merely because there seems to be an effort to block them from coming back, particularly poor minority people. And then the people that are here 
There seems to be uh, a definite move to uh, promote ideas and not promote the local people. So we have a high rate of unemployment. And you know, when we look at the um, the all of the entrepreneur news that goes out. There's not one person, a very few people from New Orleans that who are young entrepreneurs. All of these are young people from away. So, you know, I think what Katrina did was um, it further disenfranchised the African-American community, uh, not just in the education system, but also in the workplace. And the perceptions that went out uh, to the local community was, was that, you know, you know, we really are not going to include this local body. You know, we're really not going to include that. Yet, when all of our politicians run for public office, they talk about the brain drain. But there was no effort. There is, has been no significant effort to include the people that were here, the people that are from here, and include them in the process. So, Eric, I see you nodding your head. You know, and what does that coming. mean for the people of New Orleans? Uh, you know what? A everything that he said is absolutely correct, and it's, you know, it's tough for the people of New Orleans. If you, we're getting ready to release a, a research publication called "The State of Black New Orleans: Ten Years Post Katrina," and we essentially um, put data to what you just heard, and you see the wealth, the growing wealth divide um, in terms of median household income, in terms of um, health care, housing. You know, it, it does send a message when the first plan that is put forth by your policymakers to bring New Orleans back has green dots on. On it that said you're not going to rebuild in certain parts of the city. And those parts of the city so happen to be predominantly African American. And so, yes, it feels like there was an intentionality around, you know, building back in a different kind of way. And certainly it wasn't as inclusive of community members as it should have been. And so you saw the citizens rise up to say, no, no, this is our place. This is our home. We deserve to be back. We will be back. And so the plan eventually um, was killed. But, you know, it does speak to the fact that there were... Um, you know, many instances of policy decisions, our road home program, which was also challenged in court. These are not opinions that you're hearing from us. They, in mm. fact, were t tried and tested in court and found to have a discriminatory impact on the African-American community. There has to be something, you know, we have to account for the fact that there were some real instances of inequity mm -hmm. in the recovery. Right. And Anthony, I, I can see you want to, Terry, go ahead and then Anthony. Well, I think it's who it's important. So when you did the intro, you said um, you used the word experiment, that New Orleans has become in lots of ways an experiment for privatization and disaster capitalism. And I think that language is really important because that speaks to some of the frustration of a lot of local people in terms of especially education, where they are using the they here being lots of national and international and private entities using our children, black children, brown children, poor children, local yeah. children, already yeah. marginalized people, people who have been systematically disenfranchised for generations going back to the 1800s, to try some stuff and see if it's going to work and get a profit for you. And I think that's really frustrating because for us, like we didn't, they didn't give us informed consent signs. You know what I mean? Um, they're just experimenting on us and we, um, and you know, someone can jump in and say if I'm like speak, speaking, well, over speaking, well, you know, but I think I, it seems I, like we're, we're just yeah, I, mean, I absolutely. I think you. I think you're absolutely right, Terry. And when you use the word experiment, you are on point. The legislative, the legislation that was passed to take over 107 of 123 schools in New Orleans, basically listed Act 35 as an experiment. Right. So here we have our most precious resource, our most precious resource, which is our children, and our most important public service, which is public education. And this state has made them an experiment with no rules or regulations, no accountability, um, no parent participation. All of this was passed while the city had depopulated. And they come back, then we come back into this city, and we have 44 charter boards, which are basically self-appointed boards with no, with, with no requirement that they have parents on those boards or anything like that. So I think that this whole recovery, and it goes back to what was mentioned earlier, that people are frustrated about it, is because once again in the city of New Orleans, the African-American community is left out. And this right. new design for the 21st century 
is to yeah. eliminate self-governance. And Renard, as you're talking, Anthony is shaking his, is nodding his head, yeah. really trying to get in here. Anthony, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things about that is there was a University of Louisiana study that came out just this week, which really goes to the heart of how race is central to this question. When you have a situation where literally the majority of whites who were interviewed from Louisiana thought that the city had been rebuilt better in the last decade, the majority of African Americans thought the exact opposite of that. And that goes to the question of education, health, public housing, all those kind of questions. And to me, ultimately, why I think disaster capitalism and the question of the city being almost a laboratory is exactly how I've seen it in many other places around the world. In the US, including, for example, after Hurricane Sandy in New York, the rebuilding of levees, and let's face it, how increasingly now, and including in New Orleans, you have corporations that are very happy to um, give their services to the richest and the best, leaving almost by definition the poorest. So for example, if there's a need to rescue someone after a disaster, a hurricane, a storm. In other words, there is a sense that when the next disaster hits and with climate change, that's almost guaranteed somewhere, New Orleans, uh, who knows, somewhere, that those who can get airlifted out, who pay the greatest amount of money to do so, are gonna benefit and those who don't, like we're in the lower ninth ward at Katrina, they're the ones who suffer and that's why so many African Americans, as we're hearing, 10 years on, don't think, generally speaking, things have really changed. Some things have, well, I think the majority have not changed for the better. So, so they say, according to the poll. You know so a couple of our guests have actually touched on the issue of education, and we know that there's a big move uh, towards charter schools, so we have some people who are commenting on this online. Harper Royal Karen says, it's a misconception that overall parents chose charter, sco charter schools. Choice of neighborhoods, our schools were taken away. And then we have this video okay. comment from Julian. Let's take a listen to what he has to say. What does national federal data say about ed reform in New Orleans? On the NAEP, Louisiana is ranked 47th in reading and math. Louisiana charter schools perform worse than any other state when compared to traditional schools. Also, the RSD dropout and graduation rates are last and nearly last in the state. So who has been helped by these reforms? Outsiders, others who swooped into New Orleans after Katrina to profit and control New Orleans schools. So Terry, would you agree that this move towards charter schools is making things worse? Oh, most definitely. I think um, I think we often frame this conversation, especially for outside audiences, in terms of data, because it's numbers you can understand. Um, but I think, so I have a lot of social connections with people who came to the city as part of Teach for America. And I also have children who are um, a second grader a kind and a kindergartner who are now in Orleans Parish Public Schools. Um, and for me, a lot of times, the, the data doesn't get to the heart of what this problem is. So I had this, um, I was interacting with this girl, this was probably three or four years ago, who came to town for TFA, and she was really frustrated that her third graders weren't engaging in class, and she was having all these problems, and we were kind of talking about what she was having them do. And this was a white girl from the East Coast teaching in a predominantly black neighborhood in New Orleans. And she had the nerve to give them an assignment where they needed to make a family tree. On the surface, that makes sense, whatever, it's probably a common type of assignment. But she gave this assignment to a group of children with how many kids in your class are in foster care? How many kids are being raised by their grandmothers? How many kids don't know who their brothers and sisters are or have parents in jail? She was literally giving them an assignment that was compounding trauma, like personal trauma in their lives and all these things that bring shame to black communities and to like humans. Like it hurts to not know who your people are. They're like, oh, you don't have a dad or your dad is in jail. And instead of having the critical awareness about the community that she was trying to air quote serve, she was terrorizing these children and blaming them for her inability to teach. That you can't you can't translate that to data, but that's what they're doing to our children. Well, I think I think mm -hmm. that that is by design. Um, I believe that this whole experiment is not intended to work. Um, it's very very clearly obvious with the horrid, with the systemic failure that we've had these nine years. And for this city and for our policy makers to be running across the country, talking about this as a national model, it's, very, it's clearly obvious that student achievement and student welfare is not part of public, what they consider reform in public education. So what we have is, is that we have everything that Terry talks about, the things that Erica talked about in terms of the effects of poverty and this, that, and the other. Meanwhile, we have basically have these private boards and 
you know, have no training, no experience. Many of them don't meet the definition of a school. And then what you just described, Terry, you have a young person that has no clue. But you cannot put a bunch of dentists on an airplane and expect them to fly the plane. Mm. So I think that all of this is by design. And as I stated earlier, it appears that New Orleans is trying to model itself as the 21st century model. And that 21st century model is to disenfranchise minority of poor people well, Renard, at every you know, I'm, turn I'm and actually, eliminate their vote. It's interesting that you said that, because, that this is a model. I actually want to play a video uh, clip from a, uh, a video called New Orleans Recovery or Removal. And in it, it, a longtime resident talks about that feeling that you mentioned and what that actually feels like in words. So uh, have a listen to this. Every time I've been looking at the news for like the last couple of months, the more insulted and the more pissed off that I've become as I look at the as I look at the um, police driving through my neighbor driving through our neighborhoods and making this making this making this making this make believe line that this the line that I cannot cross. I went in the bywall a, a couple of weeks ago. I grew up in the night wall. I'm talking about I'm an alien in the neighborhood that I grew up in before Katrina. So, Erica, you hear that an alien in his own community. What does that feel like when community members don't feel like they have a role in rebuilding? Do you feel like you have a role in the rebuilding of your city? You know, it feels like disenfranchisement. <laughs> I mean, I think I think that those feelings are very real. If I if I can also still just circle back on the education piece, because I think that, you know, certainly a lot of focus is put on education in the post Katrina context and data, um, which was mentioned earlier in terms of, you know, how true or accurate it is can be debated. But one thing I'll say um, is that, you know, while we can say our high school graduation rate has increased, I, we put forth, then what does that all mean? When, you know, education is supposed to be the vehicle in terms of changing life, life outcomes, and you don't see the other economic indicators shifting at all, then, then what is it all for? The one thing, regardless of where you fall on the education spectrum, is that people are paying attention and having, and having conversations and dialogues across this country and across the world about education. And that could only be a good thing. We have to continue to push ourselves, even in times where we don't disagree, where we don't agree, because that is the only way to keep child-centered focus and make sure that the people like you just saw on the video who mm -hmm. feel most disenfranchised by the decisions that were made and feel left out it, it is a it is incumbent upon us to elevate their voices right. to make sure right. that they cannot be ignored. So, Anthony, one of the things that people, yeah. that other guests have mentioned and people are talking about online is the idea that local communities are not part of the conversation about how to move things forward. We have Mary who says, we talk policy structures, ideas proposed largely by, out, by outsiders, but not so much by those who love the people of the local community. And then we have I am Nikita here who says, by inviting New Orleans citizens to the decision-making tables is the first step towards making things better just in communities everywhere, yeah. not just there, how can you get basically local communities to be involved in processes to overcome outsiders who come in through disaster capitalism to solve people's problems? Look, it's a, it's a great question because ultimately what we're talking about here is a model that is exported. I've spent the last years looking at places like Haiti and Afghanistan, Papua New Guinea, the US, the UK, Australia and Greece, all very different countries. But the application of disaster capitalism means that, for example, in Haiti, after the 2010 earthquake that killed possibly two, three hundred thousand people, so many of the contractors that were coming in from the US and elsewhere, the money was not staying in Haiti. Locals were not being trained. In fact, the Red Cross recently was exposed, raised amazing amounts of money in the US. Who knows where that money has gone in Haiti? It hasn't helped the local people. And it's almost a sense somehow that in a place like Haiti, I've been there twice in the last few years, the reality on the ground is, yes, there are a few new roads and there are a few new schools, right. but ultimately the change after billions and billions of dollars when local communities are disenfranchised is that people get incredibly upset. They say, why should a white person, and it does come down to race, why does a white person from New York or Anthony, LA or Australia or anywhere else? That is a great please. question, and we're going to have to pause you there. We'll pick up the answer to that if there is one in the, in the post show at stream.aljazeera. Com. We're out of time. We'll see you there, though.
Welcome back. Thanks for joining our online post show. We're talking about disaster capitalism in New Orleans. We're going to get right back to that conversation. I had to cut off Anthony right at the very end so we wouldn't crash into the news. Uh, but I want to pick up on what he was saying. He was asking a rhetorical question, not one that I think we can get an answer to, but some of our question for our audience, uh, Anthony. Just, just briefly, essentially what I was saying was that in somewhere like Haiti, when you had the majority of contractors who were coming, say, from the U.S. who are white, and Haitians, of course, are black, they had a sense somehow that whites had to teach them how to do things, how to clear rubble. I mean, for example, there's lots of major American companies that came into Haiti who, who were given massive contracts by USAID to remove rubble, to provide water. And the reality was that they were building, including the Clinton Foundation, Hil Hillary, Bill and Chelsea, without wishing to bring into the US presidential campaign issue. Mm -hmm. But the fact is the Clinton Foundation has serious questions to answer about the way in which they have treated Haiti. There are schools that have been built and other uh, infrastructure which has got major problems, poisoning, issues around health. There's a question somehow of importing the idea of industrial parks, foreign companies coming in and using essentially slave labour of Haitians to produce clothing that uh, you might buy in Walmart or The Gap or whatever it may be. That's what's being exported and that in some ways is what's being tried in different ways in New Orleans or Afghanistan or elsewhere. The ideology is the same, the implementation can just be different. And yet, and think, you, you have, Terry, I'm going to go to you, actually, because I could see that you had so much to say, but uh, you, you hear what Anthony had to say, and yet you have people here in the States and abroad who are looking at New Orleans as a potential model, as something that should be replicated. Terry? Um, well, I think, I think what he's getting at, or what, like, what we see in this, is that really disaster capitalism, is, is the problem with it is that it's capitalism. The problem with it is that it's a continuation of colonialist systems where outsiders come ostensibly to serve or to fix or to civilize, whatever, to, do, to make it all better, to make it all right. And when they come, they have this narrative of like, we're doing this for you. But in actuality, what they're doing is reshaping your world so that it aligns with whatever preconceived notion they had of success. Um, and I think in New Orleans, you see that, we can see that in terms of the education system, right? Like we can say all we want that like, we want teachers who, we want, we want black teachers who can relate to and understand our students. And outsiders from the top down say, no, you need better discipline, you need longer school days. But you can also see that that um, that colonialist model of taking resources and putting and using them to profit outsiders to profit the colonial home country or the colonial home system or the culture base in southern Louisiana in terms of the way we export our oil and natural gas and we commodify our culture. There's a lot of profit happening in South Louisiana right now. That profit I, I is it, eroding our coastline. It's endangering yeah. us. It's taking yeah. from yeah. us. Yeah. But people are making money. They're just not us. Well. I think I think you're on point there, and 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 the the crux of it, and it goes back to what Andrew said earlier. We have a policy in Act 35 that basically has taken away the power of the vote for every citizen in New Orleans as it relates to public education. So we're the only parish in the state of Louisiana that does not have any input into its public education system, while these entrepreneurs and these predatory academies have turned our schools into profit centers. So while giving us these DNF schools and with, you know, terrible graduation rates, uh, a high dropout rate, no accountability, we have school population of 300 kids and we have three and four people making six digit salaries. And they're giving us DNF schools. Now there is no principal in the state of Louisiana other than the recovery school district that makes a six digit salary. Mm -hmm. How can we come how can we allow a charter a charter operation to have 300 students and have three or four people making over $100,000 a year and then talking about they need money because the kids don't have any books or we need money for this or we need money for that. So I, the, 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 the national model that they are promoting across the country is about controlling resources and about which children are going to go to which schools. Mm -hmm. And that's so, it. Well, and I think so it's if you're down for that, the, you know. The inequality. Because we have, so all of that is true. We do have this this education system that is blasphemously horrible. Like it, it would be hilarious if it weren't so tragic. But we also have been Franklin High School, which one is, which is which has been for decades one of the top performing public schools, it's a magnet school in the nation. So how can we have simultaneously 
a school that turns out kids who go to Yale and Harvard and, you know, who become Mellon, Mellon Fellows and all this while we have kids who cannot read. So that's inequity. So one of the things that you were touching on just a second ago, I'm actually coming to you, Erica, with this, but one of the things that uh, Terry was talking about was how a lot of people come from outside with the savior complex. We have people who are echoing that sentiment in our online community. Hudunola here says, absolutely the city, the disaster, and most of her people uh, have been exploited by Europe's. That, by the way, stands for Young Urban Renewal Professionals. Goes on to say, they believe the disaster capitalist narrative that we are illiterate and therefore need our help. Erica, I'm curious if you could have words of advice for people who are coming into the city to help. What would you tell them to make sure that they don't rub people the wrong way and, and generate these negative reactions? don't come in with the savior complex. I think that, honestly, quite frankly, if you want to be here, then you are choosing New Orleans for a certain reason, and you should um, more so embrace what makes New Orleans special rather than thinking that you should come and inflict upon the city that which you think it should be. And so I think that that would be my one piece of advice. But I just I just quickly want to want to say that, you know, we had the same situation here from an economic standpoint in terms of the contractors that came in immediately after the storm. You have, you know, when these things happen, you have a lot of things that are suspended. Davis-Bacon requirements and other things are waived, and the people that benefit most are the people who are ready to say, I'm here, I'm ready, I have the capacity. Well, clearly that can't be our own local minority businesses who were already trying to piece together their lives, right, to bring back their houses and their families. So while they're distracted, other people who don't have that those issues come in with the savior complex. And, it's, you know, so for any city that, that may have this come upon them in the future, I will say that, you know, you have to be very intentional about making sure that your citizens benefit first. Mm. So one of the, another thing that people are mm. discussing Actually. online is the issue of housing. We have Robert here who says it is false to believe that physical buildings alleviate the social, psychological, and systemic injustices. But then we also have this video comment from Toya Lewis. Let's hear what she has to say. The way public housing was built back then, uh, it was made out of steel and brick. So, you know, ain't no hurricane tearing it down. So what exists now is uh, is, is really pretty, uh, really colorful, and there's different uh, there's different groups of people that live in uh, in these these forms of housing. So, you know, it looked like it looked like a flourishing, mixed, good-looking neighborhood. However, you know, as far as access, a lot of the people who have low income don't have access to them. They've just been up for about a year or two, and they're currently having plumbing issues. Uh, like the kids who live back there, if they run and play too hard in their houses, they busting holes in the wall. Terry, I want to throw this to you. Have you heard of this yeah. before, where things are being built just for cosmetics, but in effect, it's really poor quality stuff that is being built? Yeah, well, I, I want to say first, I was happy to see Toya. Um, I think she went, if this is who I think it is, like she went to the same um, college as me, so go to no hey. Um, <laughs> Small New yeah, Orleans world. It's this big. And I think, um, sorry, I can't remember. Uh, you, I can't remember your name. I'm sorry. But I know your cousin, Amy Castano. So. Oh, yes. I love her. Look at this, Erica and Tara, Terry making connections. Oh, Terry, God. Terry, what did you want to say that I want to get Anthony um, in? But yeah, there's. I think there's a lot of, we have a lot of historic housing stock that is a lot of, um, it's, that's part of what we've commodified as our authentic culture, right? Like these, like these houses that look like they're from Europe or whatever. And they're really nice and people covet them. And so that aesthetic is really, really valuable. And that aesthetic gets incorporated into things so that, you know, contractors can say, look how authentic and real it is. But they're looking at, aesthetic, at the aesthetic and not quality. So what actually happens is, mm. you know, poor people are removed from the oldest historic housing stock, buildings made out of cypress and barge board, these buildings that stand up forever on high ground, moved to, you know, super, I can't say curse words, a horrible word, <laughs> housing stock that looks authentic, but actually only holds up for two years. Well, right. and, and, and also, I think the other yeah. issue as it relates to that is that in, re in, in the rebuilding of New Orleans, there was no consideration to rebuild affordable housing. So when they tore down the projects and, you know, they said it was terrible, 
there was no, they didn't hold the, the, the feet to the fire of the developers to ensure that every resident could return. So, Renard, so wasn't the idea took, to build uh, mixed income yeah. housing so there wouldn't be blocks of just low I income such a lie, housing? Though. I think yes. the, well, the idea well, was well, that, but the idea was yeah. to get rid of, I mean, to get rid of the yeah. problem yeah. element. I, I, I hear you both. I want to bring in Anthony because he's been trying yeah. to get in for about 10 right. minutes now. Yeah. Anthony, go ahead. Yeah. I was no, I was just going to say this is really interesting because the question of housing is something I've seen in so many places where the real issue here in some ways, the way in which America, USAID and the US government exports this ideology is that in places like Haiti or Afghanistan or elsewhere, contractors who are continuously failing to build decent housing, decent schools, are still getting more contracts even though the US government itself puts out reports explaining how incompetent they are. This is a really classic case. And when Obama was a candidate the first time around, he pledged to change that, to make the contracting system after the Bush years in Iraq and Afghanistan more accountable. Nothing has happened. In fact, it's actually probably got worse. And let's face it, going back to New Orleans and Louisiana just for a second, there are a lot of private prisons there, a lot of private prisons. And the sort of contracting that goes on there, which is becoming an issue now in the US presidential election is that a lot of the private prison lobbyists who are working alongside or closely with people like Marco Rubio or Hillary Clinton are involved in trying to make sure that certain states, including Louisiana, have a certain number of people on their beds in detention centres or prisons every night. And if they don't have that, the state pays the company a fine. Like, that's the system that we've got going in the 21st century. It's so crazy. And there's little accountability or discussion about it. So I'm really glad that we can talk about it here. <laughs> and so Anthony has just brought us up to our uh, a whole new topic of the show that I'm going to write down and give to our producers because there's actually a lot of things, <laughs> threads that came out of this discussion today that could make for a whole another 45 minutes. But I'm going to wrap up our guests. I'll give you all a, a closing thought on a point that is interesting that people are making online. So I'm sharing this tweet on my screen here. This is uh, from Adam Johnson on Twitter. And he says, what other tragedy could we speak so glibly about other than Katrina. And he mentioned some other outlets here in the U.S. And he says they're all running, quote unquote, opportunity narratives. And it is something I've seen, and I, and I, I mentioned it earlier in, today on the show, about people seeing this as an opportunity to start fresh, to start over. So what I want from you is a line or two on what you would tell people who are looking at Katrina, looking at New Orleans as an opportunity to start over fresh, what you would want them to know. Terry? Um, I think I go back often to language that we use to describe things. And so I think when we talk about New Orleans as an opportunity for a fresh rebirth, I would want people to think about, like, if if we have to have a rebirth, then somebody died. And how are you going to be fresh if you're covered in, like, literally covered in the blood of people who you have erased and who you have killed? I think if we start to think in terms of the language we use and who's paying the price and who's dying, then maybe you wouldn't be so glib about, like, the opportunity to come and, like, be fresh. Mm. Erica? Mm. You know, I think that I, you know, it's interesting as we commemorate this 10 year, I always start off by saying we have to first honor the lives that were lost. I mean, the reality is we need to be talking about the future of New Orleans as a continuation, not as a new start. And I think, you know, we, we, we hear this language and the terminology is important, right? I mean, you had terminology like refugee that really you know, um, did not sit well with all the people who were from here, native to this place, and this is home. We're not refugees. Um, and so I think we have to be careful with our terminology, and I would say that we should instead be seeing this as a continuation of progress. And we know every city has its challenges. Every, you know, to say that we were perfect is, is, is not the truth. We were not perfect. We, we did require some change, but we have to be cognizant of how we build when we build forward. Right. Renard? Well, I think, I think it is an opportunity, but it's very, very clear that, and I think Katrina is probably the most recent and perfect example, that when a disaster comes, uh, communities revert back to what they value and what they believe in. And unfortunately for us here in New Orleans, the opportunity was not for the majority of the citizens in this city, who were mostly poor and African American. The opportunity came from a few people in this city that did everything they could to exclude the return of 
of African Americans and poor people to this city, to kill the education system, to basically take them away from the table. So the opportunity has been for them to mm -hmm. structure a city that they are comfortable with mm -hmm. and where a few of them are telling all of us what to do. And at the same time, that opportunity has made many people a lot of money while we have, you know, just, I mean, poverty, 52% of uh, black males, 16, I think, to 24, are unemployed. I mean, right. the, the, the numbers are, are like horrid, despite billions and billions of dollars that came into the city. So the opportunity. Definitely more than two New sentences, Orleans. Bernard. I'm only going to have to cut you off. Yeah. I want to hear what you have to say forever, but uh, we will get cut off the internet. No, no, no. So I think you no, summed no. it up uh, quite succinctly there. Anthony, I'll get your closing words before we go to community. What would you tell people? You're, you're talking very, to very people briefly. for your book. I'll Exactly. I mean, essentially what I've tried to do in this book, which is out in September, is to go to all these different countries, Haiti, Afghanistan, and other Western countries, to actually examine how disaster capitalism really is making money for misery, whether it's through prisons, detention centres, privatised mining, um, many other sort of areas of life, which have become so normalised across, in some ways, mainstream politics in the US, in the UK, right. and in Australia. Um, yeah, which needs to be challenged. And I think in some ways, the idea that human beings are an experiment in itself right. should offend us. People need to be assisted, but it should be done, in my view, not through the idea of profit. Anthony, we'll get the rest in your book. So we'll end on a positive note, uh, an optimistic one, despite everything that's wrong. Andre here online says, the people of New Orleans are making reforms look good. Never discount the heart and drive of New Orleanians. Thanks to all of our guests, Erica McConduit Diggs, Renard Sanders, Terry Coleman, and Anthony Lowenstein. And thanks for watching. Until next time, we'll see you online.